Eagle Bud Croak joined the Center of the Presidency of Congress in January 2009 as a Senior Fellow of Leadership Ethics and Integrity, a year after speaking at the Center's National Consortium for Character-Based Leadership. Over the last five plus years, Bud has focused on spreading his message of integrity-based decision-making through youth, corporate, public service, and legal education. In 2007, Public Affairs Press published his book, Integrity, Good People, Bad Choices, and Life Lessons from the White House. Bud's work in integrity is rooted in his experiences at the highest levels of decision making. After a tour with the Navy during the Vietnam War, followed by graduation from law school, uh, where he was the editor of the University, Washington, the, the University of Washington Law Review, Bud joined John Elrickman's staff as assistant to the counsel to the president at the beginning of Richard Nixon's first term. During his time on the White House staff, Bud's responsibilities included District of Columbia Governmental Affairs, work with the Early Special Investigations Unit, eventually known as the Plumbers, law enforcement, narcotics control policy, and, the tra and transportation policy. His final position in the federal government was the Under Secretary of Transportation in 1973. As co-director of the White House Plumbers, Bud approved a covert operation as part of a national security investigation into the leak of the top secret Pentagon papers to the New York Times. He later pleaded guilty to conspiracy and served four and a half months in prison. During the five years between disbarment from the law practice in 1975 and reinstatement to the bar in 1980, Bud taught ethics, public policy analysis, and administrative law at Golden Gate University in San Francisco. After reinstatement, he focused his law practice on mediation and resolving energy policy issues in the Pacific Northwest and Canada, with extensive work in international negotiations and power rights on the Columbia River system, as well as the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission issues on the Western Interconnect. Work in the Northwest also led, led to Bud's participation in Project Pelion, and the 1990 Mount Everest Earth Day International Peace Climb. Two purpose-driven climbs that succeeded in part because of their commitment to organizational and personal integrity. Bud has had 35 years to reflect on the lessons learned from his experiences in the White House and their relevance to the more recent political and business scandals. Some of his conclusions have resulted in the Integrity Zone, a decision-making model intended to help people make choices based on integrity in their personal, personal and professional lives. With the center, Bud will continue to develop and promote new methods of encouraging integrity-based decision-making among business leaders, public servants, lawyers, and America's youth. Let's give a warm UVU welcome to Bud Crow. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you all for coming out. Is this loud enough? Can everybody hear? I just work this way. David, thank you very much. Bruce, thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. I know a lot of you are. Uh, how many of you are, are here rather than in class? I want to see how many are in trouble. Geology is in trouble. What's your class? What do you? Uh, international business. International business, you're in trouble. How about the, now the county, what were, what were you? Geology. 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 Oh, it's a, well, thank you for, I shouldn't say thank you for cutting classes, but thank you for coming. We have some in accounting here, and it, I appreciate it a lot. Well, th this afternoon, Clint Pulver gave a talk over at, uh, where were we that this afternoon? It was uh, Clint? Yeah, and I just want you to all to know uh, the, the, the quality of the education that you all are getting here at UVU is just extraordinary. And the care that you all take for each other, the work that you do to get your degrees, it's just, I've never seen anything quite like this. And I just want to thank you, Clint, and Gwendolyn, you both spoke today at lunch, and it's just, it's, it's extraordinary and the Center for the Advancement of Leadership. Uh, how, how many of you are involved in that in some way too? Okay, a good share of you. I, I think this is one of the most exciting programs I've seen anywhere in the country. And it's applied practical things that you, that you can use. And Bruce, as Bruce mentioned, we met about a year ago. And uh, I'll tell you, I, I've learned more, I think, just in talking to Bruce than I knew in the previous 20, 30 years and how he's taken these ideas and put that into a program that works directly for people as they're going through school. Uh, and I just wish you all the, all the best. What I'd like to do today, I'm just going to tell you some stories about what I learned on the White House staff working for, uh, for Richard Nixon. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit how I got there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, the King of Rock. And then we'll talk a little bit about Mount Everest. Uh, I was on a climb that, uh, as David mentioned, uh, in 1990. Uh, we'll get into that towards uh, the end, so sort of leaving a high point. 
uh, Mount Everest is 29,000, 29 feet, and I did not get to the summit, but I, I did get to 21,300 feet, and I was known as the highest altitude garbage man in the world. Uh, this was the Mount Everest Earth Day 20 International Peace Climb, so I did get a chance to get up that high. Uh, my son went up to 23,005. He was part of that climb as well. Uh, so that's the, the topic, Watergate, Elvis, and Everest, Integrity Zone Lessons from the Mother of Scandals, the King of Rock, and the Mountain Goddess of the World. I don't know whether uh, you all have available to you the Integrity Zone. Uh, I'll go through it a little bit today, but I know it's available on a website, and I think it will be available probably at the center. I, I think, Haley, we can make that available to people that, that might want to have that available and look at it. So with that, let's, let's launch right into it. And what I'd like to to offer you is if you want to speak or, or have a question, raise your hand so we can have something going back and forth while we go forward because we'll do this somewhat informally. Uh, this is the book that, uh, that David mentioned. Um, it, it takes a while to, first of all, it takes a long time to write a book, particularly when you're writing it with your son uh, who is a better writer. Uh, so I ended up doing all the first drafts and then I would send copy to him. He would review it, come back and say, with red ink and, you know, I don't understand this, explain this to me, I'll, I'll find out about this. It was really back and forth, an iterative process to put the book together. And the cover of a book is also something you try to convey what the meaning of the book is. And what we were trying to convey was that some of us were imprisoned by some wrong notions about what a president could do under certain national security issues and what those who work for a president could do. So we found this photograph of the, the actual steel uh, bars outside that is a, uh, it's taken from the South Lawn, or just on the other side of the South Lawn, to try to evoke that, that some of us did not have quite an accurate picture of what a president could do or should do under national security uh, issues. Uh, this is my co-author when he was four and a half years old. Uh, I will just say that um, he first learned about all of this stuff when he was in the car with his mom. Uh, we sort of kept things from him, and as we were, uh, he was being driven home from school, it came over the radio that Eagle Bud Krogh has been sentenced to prison. He claps his hands over his ears, and he said, I'm too young to hear this kind of thing. And so it, it wasn't for a while until he sort of understood what was really going on, and that's, uh, that has been part of what this whole process for me has been about, is to be able to work things with my sons so they could understand what had occurred back then and why I made the decisions that I did. And here he is today. Um, I will tell you that um, uh, you know when the baton has been passed in, in a, maybe a, a climbing team. Uh, I've climbed with Matt since he was about 12 years old and was always the leader uh, until we got up to about 20,000 feet on Mount Everest. And I was moving along fairly slowly. As I've mentioned to some of you, the yaks were going faster than I was, which means I'm really going slowly. And I had quite a bit of weight, and Matt was leading me up to advanced base camp at 21,003, and he said, can I carry some of your weight, Dad? And I said, well, yeah, I, I think you can. I took my pack off, gave him some weight, and the moment you do that, the baton has been passed. And from then on, I've, I've followed him. He's been, he's a great climber, uh, very measured. Uh, he was too young to be a summit climber on Everest on that climb, but he did get up to 23,500 feet three times. He was a basically a manager of an advanced base camp. Uh, and I'll get into that climb a little bit later on, too. And I like this. Miss Dugan, will you send someone in here who can distinguish right from wrong? Um, this is sort of the White House staff. I think at a certain point, those of us who worked there could have used a Miss Dugan to have some, well, someone come in here and clarify uh, what we were doing uh, or to explain to us what was right and what was wrong. We just didn't have it. I was the ethics counselor on the White House staff. And at certain times, I was not able to distinguish and make the kind of right decisions that I ought to have made. Okay, does anybody have any trouble with who these two people are? Okay, uh, now I'm gonna go through some stories of what happened in the actual White House staff. I'm sitting in my office uh, early on a Friday morning and I got a call from Dwight Chapin, who was the president's scheduling assistant. He said, Bud, you sitting down? I said, yeah. He said, well, the king is here. And I looked down at the, the president's calendar, and I said, well, which king? There aren't any kings on the schedule today. What, what are we talking about? He says, no, not any two-bit king. The king of rock, Elvis Presley, is right here, and he wants to see the president today. Well, I thought that Dwight was playing a practical joke on me. I belonged to a group of people that did this regularly, so I didn't believe him. 
And he said, no, he's written a letter to the president. He wants to see the president today. I said, come on, Dwight. I said, I'll send the letter over to you. You read it and you tell me what you think. So in about five minutes, a messenger brought this letter over to my office and I started reading it. And it looked like uh, it would have been written by maybe Dwight's daughter, who was in the fifth grade. And it read something like this. And I'll just read a couple of sentences from it. Uh, Dear Mr. President, first, I would like to introduce myself. I am Elvis Presley and admire you and have great respect for your office. I talked to Vice President Agnew in Palm Springs three weeks ago and expressed my concern for our country. The drug culture, the hippie elements, the SDS, Black Panthers do not consider me their enemy or as they call it, the establishment. I call it America and I love it. Sir, I can and will be of any service that I can to help the country out. I have no concern or motives other than helping the country out. So I wish not to be given a title or an appointed position. I can and will do more good if I were made a federal agent at large. And I will help out by doing my way through my communications with people of all ages. And then at the end of the letter, he said, I'm staying over at the Washington Hotel under the name of John Burroughs. Please call me. Well, we don't have federal agents at large in the government. And I thought that this really was a setup by Dwight, but I said, I'll, I'll play along with it. So I called over to the hotel, and a gentleman answers the phone, I believe it was Sonny West. And I said, my name is uh, Bud Krogh. I've got this letter from Elvis Presley. And I'm laughing on the phone. He said, oh, yes, yeah, that's, that's one of the four letters that Elvis Presley has ever written. I went, God, Dwight, you are really good. I mean, you, you're setting this whole thing up. I said, why don't you come on over to my office and let's talk about this. Now, I'm realizing okay, I'm going to go along with this joke and I'm going to be embarrassed, but I'm going to go, go forward with it. Well, in about 20 minutes, Washington Hotel is very close to, to the White House. I got a call from the agent at the Northwest Gate. I said, Bud, uh, we've got a gentleman here that looks a lot like Elvis Presley. Uh, he's wearing tight-fitting purple velvet pants, a silk shirt, and a purple cape. What do you want me to do with him, sir? And uh, I'm thinking that the ultimate impersonator has arrived. And he said, and there are two big guys with him, too. And I said, well, bring them down to my office. So they escorted these three gentlemen down to my office. And I expected to have an impersonator come in uh, and Dwight right behind it and say, gotcha. You know. But it was Elvis Presley. And so he came and my hand went ice cold because I was one of his biggest fans when I was in high school in the 50s. And then the fact that he would come, just come to my office was just amazing. Well, I welcomed him in. He came in. And we talked for about a half an hour, and I was just blown away. As I said, I was a great fan of his, and the fact that he was there, he's telling me about how he loves the country, wants to help the country out, and how he'd served in the military, because he was a deep patriot. He really loved his country. And I'm going, yes, right, oh, yeah, I know you went in the Army, and you were in Germany, and, and I'm, just, I'm just the biggest fan, and I'm just so excited that he's there. Well, he wanted to see the president. He said, I'd just like to see the president, tell him I want to help the country out. And now I figured, those guys have never met anyone quite like the other. I mean, Nixon's never met anyone quite like Elvis. I know Elvis hasn't met anyone quite like Nixon. Very few had. So I said, I've got to set this meeting up. So I called back to Chapin. and I said, my, I thought that was a joke. Let's do this. He got approval from Haldeman. Uh, I had asked these guys to go back to their hotel. I wrote talking points to the president. Now, I want this meeting to be a success. I want them to have a great time. Right? You're with me on that? I'm engaged in it because there's an ethical issue here that you're going to see in a minute. Well, uh, I finished my memo, sent it over to uh, the central office right outside the president's office, which they would give to the president, and he would use that, hopefully, if he needed it to, to conduct this interview. And then I called back over to the Washington Hotel and told him to come back. Well, I came back in about 20 minutes, and I got a call from the Secret Service. I said, Bud, we've got a little problem here. I said, what's that? He said, well, Elvis has brought a gun with him. He says, it's a very nice gun, a 45 Colt automatic pistol in a display case. He said, Bud, you know that no guns in the Oval Office is standard policy around here. I said, I didn't know he had a gun, uh, that he was going to bring a gun. So I rushed over and I had to take the gun on behalf of the President because I said, only the Secret Service is able to pack weapons around here, Elvis, I hope you understand that. And, and he was a little disappointed because at Graceland, uh, I found out he, he used to step out the back door and shoot off a few rounds into his target which irritated the neighbors no end. And I'm not sure what he expected the president was going to do. Let's go out and shoot a few here on the south lawn of the White House. But anyway, we took the gun, and then it was time to walk into the Oval Office. 
uh, secretary came and got me, and I ushered Elvis in, and he stops cold. He can't move. And he looks up into the ceiling, and he's got eagles emblazoned into the ceiling. He's got eagles carved into the, uh, the carpet on the floor. And I think it overwhelmed me. He's like, I'm just a poor boy from Tupelo, Mississippi, and I'm in the Oval Office of the President. Two and a half hours after that letter had been come in, he's in the Oval Office for the President. Now notice in his left hand, he is clutching pictures and badges. Now I'm not tumbling to what's going on here. I just want this meeting to go forward. I want them to have a good time, uh, and not much more than that. The President takes him over to the flags. This is the most requested photograph in the history of the Presidential Archives. They have sold over 39,000 copies of the photograph at $10 a piece. Uh, this is a profit center for the archives. Uh, there are a lot of Elvis fans, and I will tell you that probably of those 39,000, only 10 were sold to Nixon fans. It's 38,890 have gone to Elvis fans. <laughs> that belt buckle uh, was for setting um, attendance records in Las Vegas. Well, after they've been there in front of the flags, they come back over to the desk. And the phot photographer is there taking pictures, uh, and then they start to talk. Well, that's when you can see we had show and tell. Now, there's Elvis showing him pictures of his, um, of his daughter, of Lisa Marie. The president's going, very, very beautiful girl there, beautiful girl there, Elvis, and looking at him, and Elvis is, I mean, this is show and tell uh, is, is going on. And you can see that the badges are on the desk. Uh, this is my, one of my favorite pictures. Um, how many of you have seen Forrest Gump? Uh, OK, you, here's Forrest right here. If I can make this work here. Well, he's on the right-hand side. I'm not quite sure why this isn't. Is that working? There we go. That's Forrest Gump looking at Elvis and the president. Remember in that movie, Forrest Gump, he's sitting on the bench. And there's somebody sitting next to him, and he said, Mama told me that life is just like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Well, this was my box of chocolates when I woke up this morning, that morning coming in. I was going to be the person that was going to help set up the meeting between Elvis Presley and Richard Nixon. Elvis is having a great time. The look on the president's face there is, what am I doing in this meeting with this man, and how long is it going to last? He's not quite sure what he's looking at. I'm having a great, Elvis is having a wonderful time. Okay, so they start talking about things like, oh, brainwashing. Elvis said, I've been doing a study of brainwashing. The president said, brainwashing? What's uh, Good, that's good. And then Elvis said, you know, the Beatles came over here, Mr. President, made a lot of money and said some anti-American things. He said, anti-American Beatles? I said, it's a singing group, sir. Very popular singing group. I'm not sure he thought that maybe these little things were crawling around doing things that were anti-American. So I had to explain, you know, anti-American Beatles, you know, check that out. Um, and then he said how difficult it was to play Las Vegas. The president said, yeah, I know it's hard to play Las Vegas. And so I don't know how he understood that. And then well, we went through some other things. This is show and tell. These are the cufflinks uh, that Elvis is showing the president. <laughs> I'm not sure the president knew why he was looking at them or why Elvis was showing it to him at that point. And then, Elvis said, Mr. President, do you have time to see my friends from, from Memphis? And the president said, Bud, do we have time for this? I said, yes, sir, we do. I mean, you're in so deep, let's go the whole way. Let's have them all come in. So they came in, that's Jerry Schilling right next to Elvis and Sonny West. And then the reason for the meeting becomes clear. Elvis turned to the president after we'd gone through all these discussions about you know, playing Las Vegas, brainwashing, and Beatles and all the rest, and he turns to the president, Mr. President, can you get me a badge from the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs? And the president turned to me and said, Bud, can we get him a badge? Now, what's the right answer to that question if you don't have a clue? Help me with this. What should I say? Say again? Shout it out. Let me, I, let me look into it. Can I check it out? I'll find out. Let me call over. Anything. But what do you think I said? Mr. President, you want to get him a badge, we can get him a badge. I am so eager to please, to make both of them have a good time, I'm telling the President he can authorize a badge. There's a federal law against this, but I don't even see it. I just say, you want to get him a badge, we can do it. I think the President can do just about anything. And the President says, well, make sure he gets one. Elvis, overcome, 
steps forward and he grabs the president and hugs him, which wasn't the norm in that White House. Uh, you didn't hug the president, particularly just standing there. And I'm watching Elvis hugging the president, figuring probably the last meeting they're going to let me run around here. You just don't set these things up. Well, after the meeting was over, the president went behind his desk. I'll show you right here. His telephone. And on the bottom drawer are the gifts that the president would give to visitors to the Oval Office. And they're arranged according to value. The cheap golf balls are in the front, and then the expensive stuff in the back. And the president went behind there probably to get some golf balls or cufflinks. Now, Elvis didn't get to be the king of rock by not knowing where the gold is. So he went behind the desk with the president. One of my abiding members, memories of the two of them rooting through that drawer four days before Christmas 1970, and out come the expensive 16 karat gold brooches and pins and cufflinks and all the rest. And, and Elvis said, they've got sweethearts and, and wives back into the drawer. The president looks up, he's cleaning me out. You know, it's just, it was one of the funniest things that, I'd, that I've ever seen. But Elvis and the two guys left just delighted. Now, this has reached almost a cult uh, status in our country. You can buy mugs of the two of them in front of the flags, T-shirts, and all the rest. But there's an ethical idea here that is very important. I found that at times I would say things in meetings where I really didn't know the answer. But I didn't want to look like I didn't know the answer. And I was trying to please the people, the principals that I was working with. And that happens a, it happens a lot, I think, in different organizations. The White House staff, a lot of people are very young. They don't have a lot of life experience or professional history and often will answer a question before they really know the answer. There we go. And there's the badge. He carried that badge for seven years in his back pocket. If you go to Graceland, it's in the Hall of Awards down at the end on the left. And if you go to the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda, you will see the gun. Uh, because those were the two items that came out of this meeting that they cherished. Um, that badge is currently in Washington, D.C. on a display about Elvis's history and his life because this is the 75th, this would have been the 75th birthday uh, for, for Elvis this year. Now, how did I get to Washington, D.C.? Well, I had a gentleman by the name of John Ehrlichman, who's the right person here on the right side, and, the, and Nixon, who was my mentor. And if there's one idea that I can communicate today, it's that mentors really matter in your life. Having an individual or individuals at different times who are people that can help you uh, when you're going through an, an educational process or your first few months, first few years in a job, having someone who will look after you and who can help you move along. And I know that's one of the central ideas here at the Center for the Advancement of Leadership is mentoring. And I can just tell you that if my mentoring had sort of been reversed other than the way I got it, my life might have been different. But John Ehrlichman was my, my mentor. He was the law partner in the law firm where I worked. After and I, My family had known his family for a very long time. And I was practicing in his firm. I'd been a practicing lawyer for two months. And he came up to Seattle after the election in 1968. And he came into my office and he said, do you like your job here? I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, would you consider changing your job? I said, yes, sir, I would. He said, would you consider leaving Seattle to come to Washington, D.C. to be staff assistant to the council to the president? Yes. I didn't think twice. I just said, yes, I would love to go do that. Now, what background did I have in high government affairs? I had been in college. I'd spent three and a half years in the Navy on a ship, the USS Yorktown. I was a communications officer, an officer of the deck underway. I was a, was a division officer, but I had no background or experience in high government affairs. I went to law school for three years. I worked on land reform in Vietnam for part of that time, but the rest of it I was studying law in preparation for taking the bar exam. And then two months after practicing law, I'm given this opportunity to go back to Washington, D.C. to work in the White House. Now, given that background, I'd just like to poll all of you. How many of you, when asked if you would like to come back to Washington, D.C., would have turned, turned it down? OK. That's, uh, I, how could you turn it down, I mean, that opportunity? Thinking, I'll learn it when I get there. I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll try to understand it. Well, for the most part, I think some of us did, who were very young, but not all of us. 
and I ended up working in this building here in the Hotel Pierre. Uh, we had a one funny episode there of a man who was going to be in our cabinet. Our room had three doors. One went into the restroom, one went into the closet, and one went into the hall. And we spoke with this man who's going to be in the president's cabinet, and his lawyer left, went out in the hall. And Ed Morgan, who was the lawyer I was working with, he and I turned uh, to, after we'd finished, sat down at our desks, and this gentleman turns around and walks into our closet and shut the door and didn't come out, um, which is a problem. Uh, because I'm looking at Ed Morgan, and we know we've got this guy in our closet who's too embarrassed to come out, and we can't indicate we know he's in our closet because we're going to have to work with him. We can't laugh, whatever. You don't know what tension is until for 30 seconds you've got a man in your closet who doesn't want to come out. Finally, he did. You could see that doorknob turn, and out he goes like the pa Pink Panther into the hall. Uh, that's the only thing I really remember about the transition. I was reading full field investigation reports, getting ready to go down to Washington, D.C. And when I got down there, I worked in this building, uh, the West Wing. Um, that, well, Josiah Bartlett worked over there, and Rob Lowe worked right here. You know, if you go through the cast of the West Wing, you can see where all these people worked. Uh, actually, this is probably where uh, Rahm Emanuel is probably over here, and General Jim Jones, who worked for President Obama, is right there. Okay. I'd been there a very short time. And I got a call from Virginia Nauer, Consumer Affairs Advisor to the President. And again, I'm a very junior person on the White House staff. And she said, Bud, I've been asked to testify tomorrow before a House Agricultural Committee on the fat content of the American hot dog. I would like to testify in favor of reducing that fat content by 2% from 32 to 30%. And I thought to myself, 2% is not much of a hot dog. Sounds good to me. Go with it, Virginia. And she asked me a second time. She said, Bud, is it the administration's position that we support reducing the fat content in the American hot dog from 32% to 30%? Because if we take this position, it's in all likelihood that bill will, will pass because we're a Republican administration not known to be interested in nutritional things. The Democrats will want this, and this will become the new fat content limit, 30%. Go with it, Virginia. I don't want to be bothered with all this technical stuff. It's not important. So she testified the next morning. Three hours after she testified, there was a headline in the Evening Star, uh, major administration shift on weenie. And then the phone calls started coming in from the meatpackers all over the United States, from Colorado to Nebraska to Kansas to Oklahoma to Iowa, Illinois, Texas. And the question was, who is the idiot who approved reducing the fat content by 2%? Do you know how many hot dogs are consumed in America? 633 per second, 20 billion per year. 2% of 20 billion hot dogs is a lot of meat that has to be there in lieu of fat. It's a huge economic effect. I just didn't see it. It just went, psh, sounded like a good idea, go with it. Now, I thought I was going to get fired for that. And in retrospect, I should have been, and I wished I had been, but I wasn't. <laughs> and here's what happened. The President of the United States saw the same headline, Major Administration Shift on Weenie. And he called up Virginia Nauer, who had called me, and here's what he said to her. You can go Google the story right now, and it will come out. Just what Nixon said to her, she called me up knowing that I'm getting all of these calls from outraged meatpackers around the country. And she wanted to reassure me. And she called me and I said, oh, Virginia, how bad is it? Because I probably pack my bags and go home. She said, oh, no. No, it's not that at all. Here's what the president said. Now, I'm going to t say it to you the way Richard Nixon said it to her. Stick to your guns, Virginia. I'm behind you 100%. I came from humble origins. Why? We were raised on hot dogs and hamburgers. We've got to look after the hot dog. I said, say that last one again, Virginia. We've got to look after the hot dog. And I thought to myself, that's better than ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I said, that's one of the best presidential prose I have ever heard. I said, Virginia, just don't tell me about this. Call all the news magazines. Let them know what the president did and said. So she did. And this comes back in uh, Time magazine, June 27, 1969 a little story called Looking After the Hot Dog. 
Well, the president didn't connect the economic dots either. What should I have done? Now, if we're going to make the decision based on the nutritional value of less fat content hot dogs, that's okay. But take into account the economic consequences of that judgment, and then you can weigh them and decide which one ought to prevail. I didn't do that. I didn't see the consequences. I just said, go with it. She did. Fortunately, Nixon didn't connect the economic dots either. And unfortunately, I kept my job. So anyway, that was another example of maybe not thinking things through. You know, I've already authorized the badge. I'm going forward with this less fat content hot dog. And what I'm trying to point out is integrity requires us to think through the consequences, to take time and to be willing to admit if you don't know something. You all know this name, G. Harold Carswell, a nominee to the United States Supreme Court. I was in a meeting at the Department of Justice uh, with the President, or rather with the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General and this gentleman. And the Deputy Attorney General turns to Judge Carswell and says, Judge, have you ever said anything that could be remotely construed as racist? And Judge Carswell said, no, sir. I've never said anything and I've never thought those thoughts. I said to myself, he just over-answered the question that he was posed. He wasn't asked whether he ever thought those thoughts. He was asked, have you ever said anything? Why? Because a reporter could pick it up. Well, I felt something was fundamentally wrong right at that point. It was an answer that suggested he was too eager for the job. And so after the lunch, I didn't say anything to the Attorney General. Why? I didn't want to displease him. The Attorney General is a guy I had to get along with because I was the law enforcement liaison between the White House and the Justice Department. Went back to the White House and Ehrlichman said, how'd lunch go? And I told him, he said, well, what do you think? And I said, John, something doesn't feel right. My intuition tells me there's something that's not quite right. And he said, are you prepared to stop this nomination from going forward based on your intuition? What's the right answer to that question if you're asked that question? What do you all think? Anybody have an idea? Glenn? Yes. I, something doesn't feel right. I can't put my finger on it, but I need more time. I've got to look into this. I said, no, sir, I'm not willing to do it. Nomination went forward within, I would say, probably 24 hours. A reporter found a terrible story uh, that appeared in a paper in Georgia. It was a story about a comment that the judge Judge Carswell had made when he was running for the legislature in, in Georgia when he was 26. And here's what he said. A reporter found it. I believe separation of the races is proper and the only way of life in America. I yield to no one and to no man in the firm, vigorous belief in white supremacy and I shall always be so governed. Well, it's just devastating. I mean, it's just... Uh, it, it helped to kill that nomination. He lost 51 to 48. It was a second one that we'd lost. And it was in part because I was not able to trust my own sense of what's right. And that's what I wished I'd had a better developed sense of that and been willing to trust it and to say, wait, I need more time. I need to look in it. And sometimes you're going to be in positions where things won't be really clear, but you'll have a feeling about it. And that's where you want to sort of back off and say, wait a second, I need more time. I need to understand this better. Okay, moving forward, worked in this office, in the old executive office building. The president had an office right there, and mine was right here. He spent a lot of his working time in that office, not in the Oval Office. Okay, now we're going to move into what got me into very deep trouble in the White House staff. This is Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, he is a Harvard graduate. Uh, had a PhD from Harvard, uh, written a decision-making uh, uh, dissertation, or dissertation on decision-making in a field of uncertainty. Uh, he was a combat Marine, served in Vietnam, and then became one of the architects of the Vietnam War. Uh, he was one of the great theoreticians at the time. Uh, this is before going into combat down in the fourth military region. He started out as a strong supporter of the war in Vietnam, and then shifted dramatically to where he became one of the most outspoken opponents of the war. In June of 1971, Daniel Ellsberg released to the New York Times a set of papers known as the Pentagon Papers. They were a top secret history 
of the United States' involvement with the war in Vietnam. These papers uh, stopped with the presidency of Lyndon Johnson. They didn't even get into Nixon's presidency. Daniel Ellsberg felt that the American people needed to know this information. He took them, basically stole them from the Rand Corporation where they had been under lock and key and gave them to the New York Times. He felt he was doing his duty at that time. The White House staff felt that he was acting like a traitor, somebody who was an enemy, somebody who would give up top secret information for his own personal political gain, that this was one of the worst things that he could do. Richard Nixon was furious. Dr. Henry Kissinger, who then was the National Security Advisor, was outraged by it and called Ellsberg the most dangerous man in America. This is a cover of Newsweek uh, at that time. It was a battle over whether those documents ought to have been published. We tried to go to the court to restrain them from being published. We lost in the Supreme Court by a vote of six to three. It was in that context, I had come back from Vietnam where I'd been doing an analysis for the president on the drug issue. I had reported to him in San Clemente, told him what was going on. The president wanted to set up a special investigations unit to find out everything about why Ellsberg had released those documents to the New York Times. Who was he working with? Was he working for the Soviets? We had intelligence that indicated proved later to be untrue, but at the time we didn't know it, that a full set of these documents had gotten to the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C. before they'd ever gotten to the New York Times. It raised this question, is he working for the Russians? Now, in that context, I was summoned to the Oval Office to meet with the President on July 24, 1971. And the day before, the full fallback position of the, of the United States in the strategic arms limitation talks in Helsinki had been leaked to the New York Times. The president was as angry as I had ever seen him. Uh, he said a lot of words that I could not possibly repeat in public to convey how strongly he felt about this, slamming his fist into his hands. And when I sat down, he said, now I want you to set up a polygraph. This is the president telling me to polygraph all the people who might have had access to these documents. This is national security and will not be allowed. And he talked about both the Pentagon Papers and the Salt Lake. And he's pointing his finger right at me. I took that seriously. I went back to my staff. I told them, I said, the president feels very strongly about this. We are supposed to find out everything we can about him, his mental state, the likelihood he will release other documents. Who is he working with? Has he been pressured by the Soviets? All the things that I thought was my responsibility. And the president had used the term national security to justify it. Well, I went back to my staff, which consisted of, let's see if I can make this work. Now, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna just have to point that. There, there I am up here. This is my colleague who left the country two years after all this went down and hasn't really returned. He's been in England, David Young, who was there for Henry Kissinger. E. Howard Hunt, who was given to the unit by the CIA, and Gordon Liddy from the FBI, who I hired. Have you heard any of those names, Gordon Liddy or E. Howard Hunt? Some of you heard some of them. Anyway, this was my team, and I told them about how the president viewed the leak of the Pentagon Papers. It's a national security crisis. And the gentleman down below here, E. Howard Hunt and Liddy, Liddy made the recommendation that we ought to conduct a covert operation to examine all of the files still held by Dr. Ellsberg's, this guy's, psychiatrist, to find out if he was mentally unstable. Is he likely to release other documents? Was he working with other people? Has he been under pressure? And I said, now, have you done this before? The answer was yes, we have done it before. The FBI has carried out many of these operations. Have you carried them out, Gordon? Yes, I've carried them out. I said, well, when could they do it? Well, they could do it in September. Uh, this was now in early August 1971. I said, well, how much will it cost? Now, what are all these questions that I'm asking? They're operational questions, aren't they? Just basically, we sort of made up our minds, we're going to do it. Let's just go through the administrative details. Three of the four of us in that unit were lawyers. What we didn't ask was, what's a logical question for a lawyer to ask? Is it legal? I mean, it's, well, you would think you, that would be one of the first things. But we're in this unit 
where we are so pressured to get results, we don't even ask that question. It's a how do I get this information about Daniel Ellsberg. In that context, we, David Young and I, wrote a memorandum to John Ehrlichman and we said we recommend that a full set, or actually we recommend that we look and have an operation to look into the psychiatrist's files and a covert operation be carried out to do that look and photograph it. Ehrlichman wrote, approved, if done under your assurance, it is not traceable. And at that moment, the whole world shifted for the Nixon administration. What had we done? We had recommended a felony, thinking that we were doing something that was a national security operation. About four weeks later, September 3, 1971, a break-in occurs in the office of Dr. Lewis Fielding in Beverly Hills, California. Nothing was found. They broke a window going in and they took pictures of it and came back and showed me the pictures. I said, was there something unclear about the word covert that, that you all had promised to do here? I mean, this is terrible. I showed them to Ehrlichman. He said, shut it down. End of it. Well, at that point, I felt that this was a busted national security operation and nothing more than that. There had been a lot of busted national security operations. I didn't say anything to anybody, neither did Ehrlichman. Ehrlichman met with the president, and the president who knew we were investigating Ellsberg, Ehrlichman told him just a few days after I'd showed him these photographs, we had an operation in California. It's better that you not know about it. So the president didn't know what had happened. It's just Ehrlichman, myself, and my team, and that was it. Well, I felt that we needed to find a new job for Gordon Liddy. Uh, he ended up going over to committee to reelect the president. Um, there is the killer memo. We would recommend that a covert operation be undertaken to examine all the medical files still held by Ellsberg's psychiatrist covering the two-year period in which he was under psychoanalysis. I mean, if you're a prosecutor, that is the most golden evidence you can possibly get with a big E from my boss and then said, uh, if done under your assurance, that it is not traceable. Now, what's happening here is integrity was absolutely absent. We didn't ask, well, what's, what's really going on here? What are the consequences of this? What are the legal issues? Is this the right thing to do? Is this a good thing to do? None of those questions were asked. Here's the sequence, the Pentagon Papers released in 71, Plumber's Covert Operation, September 71, Watergate break in June of 72, Plumber's Operation revealed May of 73, and Nixon resigns in 1974 because of the cover-up that occurred after Watergate so that investigators would not get back to what had happened in 1971. That's the sequence. That's what happened. And there it is. You can see it in a different pictorial, all those different things. Watergate, it's a serious, serious event, but the most serious one was what we were involved in in 1971. I thought this was a national security operation and justifiable. I defended myself for two years until I went down to this building after I'd been indicted for this in both California and also in Washington, D.C. It was out behind the House of Burgesses. This is at the end of Duke of Gloucester Street. And it was like, isn't this amazing? I'm able to, able to drive down here with my kids and my wife. I'm under indictment. Now, what's really going on here? I'm enjoying all of these rights, but I'm defending the right of someone in government under some questionable doctrine of national security to strip away his right to be free from an unreasonable, unwarranted search. How can I enjoy these rights and defend that without being the worst form of hypocrite? And the answer came clear, I can't do it. And I turned to my wife and I said, I've got to plead guilty. And she said, what, well, this means loss of our job. I mean, I mean you, you, know, we, you might have to go to prison. You might not be a lawyer. I said, all oh, that's true. But I don't believe in this defense that national security justifies what we did. And that came to me when I was down in that town right behind that building. So I was in the office of this man. Four days later, I, went, I want to plead guilty. But I'd like you to accept my plea on the basis that I don't have to talk to the grand jury or an assistant U.S. attorney until I've been sentenced by a court. And he accepted my plea on that basis. I then, six weeks later, was uh, before Judge Gerhard Gazelle 
U.S. District Court judge in Washington, D.C., who sentenced me from two to six years in prison. He said, however, I have read your record. I've had 93 letters written on your behalf. I will suspend it all, but for six months. So I ended up uh, going to a maximum security jail for the first 10 days, and for the la last four months plus, I was at the Allenwood Prison Camp uh, up in uh, central Pennsylvania. Now, prison, jail was, a, for me, the right place for me. I knew that Richard Nixon wanted to pardon me. And I knew that if I pleaded guilty, I was going to pay the price and I didn't want to be pardoned. So uh, I did not get a pardon. Uh, it would have been, I think, the end of it for me if I had. So while I was in jail, I had people looking after me the whole time that I was there. Um, there was one gentleman there who said, I've taken a liking to you, Krogh. He said, uh, I specialize in stereos. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I steal them. I've got a great fence. And he said, um, would you like to work with me when you get out, or are you going to go straight? And I said, well, you know, I'd given crime a shot. And I said, I am not really very good at it. I don't have much talent there. He said, you're the worst I've ever seen. He said, why didn't you call me when you needed professional help? I said, I didn't have your number. I mean, it's, it's almost surreal about what's going on in, in those environments. But I was looked after the whole time that I was there. Um, when I got into uh, this cartoon came in, said, Eagle Crow, huh? Say, you're not the famous Birdman of Alcatraz, are you? Uh, so that was my nickname while I was in jail and prison was Birdman, which was better than other things that I could have been called. Um, and over the next, oh, 20, 25 years. I got to thinking, what happened that led to that decision? Well, it was a breakdown in integrity. And if there's one idea that I hope you can take away today, is that no matter where you are, you cannot abdicate your own personal sense of integrity. You can't just do something because you think somebody else wants you to do it or expects you to do it. It has to line up with what you think is right. I got four commissions when I was in the White House staff. Each one started with this language. Reposing special trust in your integrity, prudence, and ability, I do appoint you to this position. Now, it's not the integrity of the president or John Ehrlichman, who had been my mentor. It's yours, and that's the basis on which you get this job. If I'd understood that better and had been explained to me by a mentor at that time, I like to think that maybe life might have been a little bit different. I wrote an article about that. Uh, it was published in the World Peace Through Law Quarterly as well as the Christian Science Monitor. I wrote it to the Bush staff in 2001, nine months before 9-11. And in that I said, on national security issues, do not use wild interpretations of the law, but use what interpretations are generally well accepted as to what commander in chief and national security mean, and not what they can be tortured into meaning. Some of you know that there have been some memoranda that have been written that I think tortured the meaning of certain words to achieve the result that they wanted. And here we are at the integrity zone concept again. The three basic questions in the central part of that zone are, is it whole and complete? Meaning if I thought through the consequences, is it right and is it good? None of those questions were asked during that seven week period in 1971 when the White House Special Investigations Unit, known as the Plumbers, was operating, just didn't get there. And we had all of these threats coming at us. Group think, these are the outside, pulling us out of that integrity zone. Pressure for results, ambiguity of mission, high stakes, secrecy, pressure to conform, adversarial climate, and then some of the internal threats. This is you personally. Youth and inexperience, ignorance, arrogance, blind ambition, vanity, incompetence, fear all of those things. That's just taken from a seven week period on the White House staff. And the one thing about being safe is to understand the context or the situation in which you're operating. Are you operating under pressure? Are you able to speak what you feel? Are you able to stay in touch with your own sense of what's right? Which is a critical way to stay safe in high pressure positions. Those are the three basic questions. If you can answer yes to those and understand the situation you have a good shot at being safe. External threats, I'm gonna go through. How many of you have heard the word group think before? Okay, most of you have heard that term. It was coined by Professor Irving Janus in a book called Victims of Group Think, 
to describe some foreign policy disasters that had occurred in part because of groupthink. Here's how you discern it. Do you feel undue pressure from your leaders? Do you feel strong peer pressure from others to conform? Are you able to share your views freely and without fear of reprisal? Do you feel invulnerable? Are you stereotyping opponents as enemies? Well, let me show you what groupthink is. In this picture, you have the president in the middle. You have to his right, the attorney general, and to his left, the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. And then you have, in the bottom left, uh, uh, John Ehrlichman, that's the president, and then I'm on the upper left. And the president comes in and he says this, I've got this great idea to make it a federal crime to kill a policeman in the line of duty. He turns to the attorney general and said, that's a brilliant idea, Mr. President. Turns to Hoover and said, I agree with the attorney general, brilliant. Turns to Ehrlichman and says, what do you think, John? Says, I agree with the attorney general and the director. Turns to me, bud, what do you think? Well, I've done the research. And I know that over 90% of these crimes are solved within 30 days by local law enforcement. I know that the local law enforcement does not want to have automatic invocation of federal jurisdiction because these are crimes that they pursue as aggressively and successfully as any crime that they investigate. I also know that it violates our notion of federalism where power should rest, police power, with the state and the locals. I know that, but I don't say that. It comes to me. Bud, what do you think? I said, I agree, Mr. President. Yep, 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 we can do that. Now what happened was a wave, a psychological wave, which Janus described as groupthink, went through that group and when it got to me, I didn't have the courage to say what I really felt. You all with me on that, how that happened? It happens in a lot of different contexts. So be aware of when it's happening. Now it took me two weeks to reverse that decision. And here's what happened. I went to Ehrlichman and said, you know, I, I didn't speak up. He said, why didn't you speak up? I said, frankly, I was afraid to speak up there. I mean, these are guys, that, these are the, the toughest guys in the country. They're the most senior people, the president, the attorney general, the director of the FBI, and you, John. I just I couldn't say it. And then he said, well, you're going to have to go talk to the director of the FBI. I went to see Hoover, and Hoover said, I didn't want to do that anyway. He said, I have too much to do. And I went to see Mitchell, and Mitchell said, I think that's a bad idea. We shouldn't have done it. Nobody wanted to do it. You see, and it's, it's like if I'd had the opportunity maybe to say, wait, I've done some research here, Mr. President, that suggests maybe it might not be necessary. I might have gotten some support from the others rather than just caving in and going along with that psychological momentum that had built up when the leader comes in. Now, partly, this is a, a problem of leadership, of not giving people the opportunity to speak candidly as, as to what they thought and what they felt. Internal threats, vanity, misplaced loyalty. And let's see if I can get this forward. Now, this picture is where I'm getting sworn in to be an undersecretary. I've got my right hand up, left hand's on the Bible, and I am swearing to uphold the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, so help me God. But what I'm thinking is, I work for this man. That's in my mind. But the loyalties have to be lined up properly. When you take those positions, you swear to uphold the Constitution. That is your oath. That's the primary loyalty. You have to have personal loyalties, but you also have to have a primary loyalty to that higher sense, which in this case was the Constitution and the statutes, and I just didn't see it. Here's the integrity zone, how it works. That's the inside of that. Integrity is about speaking truth to power, as the old Quaker saying goes, when silence would be easier or more advantageous to your interests, or yup, yup, which is what I said in that meeting. Now, I was at this point coming down from the summit of Mount Rainier right after I got out of prison. I went to Disney World and I went out to Mount Rainier, was climbing, coming down. 8.30 in the morning, I'm right at that point. Uh, which is called Disappointment Cleaver, if I can get this to come back, right at this point. And while that was happening, this was happening in Washington, D.C. Richard Nixon was resigning the presidency. They might say, well, what really happened? Why did he have to resign his presidency? Well, he said something 
right there from that podium, August 9th, 1974, which I put at the end of my book, which I think explains what happened. After acknowledging those staff members who had given so much to their country, thanking those who had stood by him, and expressing his adoration for his saintly mother, he said this, always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them, and then you destroy yourself. He finally came to a realization of what had happened. His hatreds were sort of extended to the staff. We saw Ellsberg as a traitor and an enemy. He wasn't that, but that's the way he was seen by Kissinger, the most dangerous man in America, an enemy. We bought into that, and that evoked a response that was far beyond what the threat would justify. And I think that uh, in talking to his brother, who said that he thought, felt really did reflect why Richard Nixon had to resign. I was on the Muir snowfield coming down. There was another team coming up singing. We have a new president. We have a new president. I stopped and took off, off my pack. I realized, okay, it's finished. And I have to go apologize to him, which I did. Uh, I went down to see him about, uh, oh, four days later. Uh, first, I went to see Dr. Lewis Fielding, who was Ellsberg's psychiatrist, to apologize to him for what we had done to him personally. You can go through the legal process, but until you've completed the, the task of saying you're sorry to the person who you have harmed, it's not done yet. And then the next day I went to see Richard Nixon to apologize to him. Some of you might recall that photograph. It's uh, just before he got on the helicopter to leave uh, Washington, D.C. at the end of his five years, five and a half years. Now after I got out of um, government, I went to do some other things. I had to teach for five years because I had no means of livelihood. I was no longer a practicing lawyer. This man became my mentor. And all I can tell you is if I'd had him as my first mentor rather than the one later on in my career, my life would have been different. Bill Dwyer was the most ethical man that I had ever known. A wonderful person. He took my case from right after I pleaded guilty all the way through seven years until I was finally reinstated uh, to the practice of law. And it took us from December of 1973 when I was initially suspended to October 22nd, 1980. Uh, that's where we are at the Seattle Center. Um, I was sworn in and within about a day after that, I was offered the opportunity to go to work in his law firm. And I stayed in his law firm for 15 years until that firm dissolved. He's a great man. He was my colleague. He was my friend. He was my lawyer. And then he became a district court judge. Now, while I was in the firm, I felt I'd like to be involved in something that is really good, where there's really great ideas and integrity is the foundation of it. And this led to participation in a mountain climb. This is the last piece of this talk the Mount Everest Earth Day 20 International Peace Climb. This took place in the, there's Mount Everest from the north. Um, this is a time delayed sequence. Uh, our route was to take us up this route to the summit, coming down here. Let's go down here, this is the north call, down to where Advanced Base Camp was. Jim Whitaker was one of the great leaders and the great climbers of our generation. The first American to summit Mount Everest. And when we started doing our organizing for this climb, he said, one thing we are going to be doing here, looking after each other, we're going to clean up this mountain, safety is number one, human life is the most valuable thing we have. And we built that into every decision that, that we made about this climb, because we felt we want to show what climbers from Russia, Tibet, China, and the United States can do together, cooperatively. And the climb went off magnificently. It was one where we got 20 people on the summit over a period of about two and a half weeks. Nobody got killed. We all came back friends. It was great, and I had the opportunity to be up there with my son. When it got back to the White House, was able to show the route to President Bush, who was delighted with it. He said, I want to talk to you guys when you get up to base camp. So we had a satellite feed with Whitaker 
Uh, I'm there holding the map, uh, showing him the route that I just showed you, how we were going to get up to the top. And then George Bush, President Bush first, uh, talked to us uh, during Earth Day 20 to congratulate us and wish us well and the rest. It was really one of the more exciting things in my career. Here I am with Whitaker. We're at base camp. Uh, I'm about to go up to advanced base camp to clean up some of those camps. You can't really clean up much above 21,000 feet. It's just too risky. So we didn't do much about, above that. Uh, so there's a lot of trash, 23,000 up to the summit at 29,000. There I am. You get there, you get a little bit fuzzy. Uh, high altitude garbage man. And that's my son on the left, two other climbers. Um, as he was going up to advanced base camp. But that had integrity built into it right from the start. We had a leader, when he would hold his meetings, there was no such thing as group think. He insisted that everybody say what they felt, what they thought, and then he would take it under advisement. I mean, it was never like I felt I would be in trouble if I had to say what I really felt. And that's so different when you're running something where you, you can open it up and people feel comfortable when they have to something to say. And that's our whole team. 20 people of that group made it to the summit. It was the most successful climb of Mount Everest in history up to that point. And I think that is attributable to the values that were built into the climb right from the start. It had deep integrity. Now I just want to conclude with a couple of things that Richard Nixon in many ways was a great president in my judgment. We made serious mistakes. But this man understood how the world worked. He had this vision of opening up China well before he became president. And he was able to ex execute that and in February of 1972 step off Air Force One in Beijing and greet Chairman Zhou Enlai. Um, and then that opened up a whole new era in our relationships with China. It changed the geopolitical map as profoundly as I think the Marshall Plan did after World War II. Opening to China was a huge thing. He also ended the war in Vietnam. I think it took him too long to do it. That was my personal judgment. But he did end it while he was there on terms that I still have some questions with. But we started with 530,000 soldiers in country on our first day, and there were none when he left. So something went on. He also worked out rapprochement with the Soviets. On domestic policy, he did some of the most, I think, extraordinary things. He created the National Environmental Policy Act, he actually signed that statute, set up EPA, did clean water, clean air, endangered species, all the pillars of the environmental movement. He did all of those things. But overshadowed by Watergate and the plumber's work the year before, I often have thought, boy, if we just hadn't done that, what great things could have uh, been accomplished. There he is at the Great Wall. There he is signing the SALT Agreement with Brezhnev on May 26, 1972. Now, I just want you to know, I'm working at the Center for the Study of the Presidency. You have the opportunity to meet some great people. And six weeks ago, uh, this gentleman came into our staff uh, to meet David Abshire. I can't tell you uh, how impressive uh, General David Petraeus is. Uh, but uh, he spoke to everybody in that staff. He was as warm and humble, open, kind as anybody I think I've ever had the privilege of meeting. I don't know where he's going to put the next of his uh, awards. He's pretty well full that, filled up that jacket. Uh, but a very great man. I'm just going to conclude with this statement from Heraclitus. The soul has dyed the color of its thoughts. Think only on those things that are in line with your principles and can bear the full light of day. The content of your character is your choice. Day by day, what you choose, what you think, and what you do is who you become. Your integrity is your destiny. It is the light that guides your way. I think that, that if I understood that better, had that on my wall when I worked on the White House staff, history might have been different. I think it's something I try to encourage Students, high school, college, law students, this is very profound. It's what you do day by day. And I can just say that from what I've experienced here at UVU, Bruce, Dave, and all of you involved, it's extraordinary what you do for each other and how you're helping each other along. You work for this education. 
Uh, it's just got deep integrity, and I'm very grateful that you invited me. Thank you very much. Thank you.